I, 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 I honestly don't remember if I um, threw anything in his direction. I, I don't think I did. Um, I just remember him having me by the nightgown. Um, I remember him flailing me, throwing me around. I'm flailing. Um, I, this is after um, there were some bottles broken on the floor. Uh, I think this is actually after, again, forgive me, I wish I could remember the sequence, but it's flashes. He's throwing these bottles at me. Um, I remember retreating. There were also cans, like uh, soda cans, beer or soda cans, and they're coming at me one after the other, and I keep pulling myself into the bar area. There's a bar behind me in like a, I don't know, like an L shape. He's standing in the only way you can exit, so I'm kind of trapped in front of this sink, surrounded by bar on three sides with him in front of me-ish, kind of front off to the, off to the left. And he's throwing these bottles one after the other and I can feel glass breaking behind me. I remember feeling um, one of them go by my head really fast. I mean, the, a, veloci a real velocity. I remember being terrified. I remember I couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I eventually, I'm trying to, I don't know, he ran out of things to throw. I think that's how I moved myself towards the exit. And I believe that's most likely when we got kind of in this struggle by the bar area. Um. All right, I'll go first on this one. We see another huge one-sided shoulder shrug. And like we talked about before, that indicates she's not totally comfortable with her answer. It doesn't really mean it's deceptive. There are no absolutes. That means just because somebody does something, scratches their nose or bites their mouth, it doesn't mean they're being deceptive or telling the truth. It's just one of those, uh, a cue you look for to add to a, to a group of cues to make sure uh, things are going in the direction you think they're going. Um, the biting on one side of her mouth seems to be a, seems to be an adapter at that point, but it falls right in line with all the other cues that she's displaying. Um, to show she's tentative, unsure, and uncomfortable. And she's displaying plenty of, of anger, disgust, and contempt cues, and a lot of what we've seen up to this point. And also there's that word again, remember. Here it is one more time. And let's pay attention to how it's being used up to this point. It's just here and there right now. It's not very often, it's sparingly, but it's getting ready to, to go off the rails with it here in a couple of minutes. So this is important, so start, start listening for it and start counting them when you hear them. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? That biting the side of the mouth, I agree with you, is typically an adapter. It's bigger than an adapter with her here because she does it three times in three videos, and they're all pre-violence. If I am a child and I always do that and I get away with it, I'm probably going to do that the rest of my life. And that's not an acting thing. She didn't learn that somewhere, and that's part of a character she's prepared for. That's probably something as a little kid, they would get after her and she'd do, mm, and they'd think it was cute or something. Don't know. But what I will tell you is it shows up three times. All three times are pre-violence. Something that's an indicator in her case, just her case. Other one, she rubs her face, and you would think she's got tears there or something. There was no tears in her face as far as we can see. She does one of the best denials I've seen him forever, meaning the worst. I, I, I honestly don't remember if I um, threw anything in his direction. I, I don't think I did. I honestly, one shoulder rise, don't think I did. Well, that's about as far as you can go to saying I did without saying it, because we associate one shoulder, as Scott said, with not be feeling certain or uncomfortable with what we're saying. And it's very pronounced in this case because she does this most of the time. I honestly, there's a qualifier, so she's distancing and qualifying at the same time, and then says, don't think I did. So she's got another cutaway. That's a long sentence. She threw a bottle, clearly. I mean, this is now starting to look like maybe Johnny Depp's telling the truth. So we just have to follow it. She um, goes, I, I just remember, remember inside of her mouth, she bites that thing. And then I, I, I'm almost certain she threw a bottle at him here, and that's what started whatever happened here. Then she does a tongue jut at the end of him flailing or throwing her around. I'm flailing. She does a distaste. After some bottles broken on the floor. Well, that sounds a lot like, yeah, that's passive voice. There's a whole bunch of broken bottles. Then she goes in that again, forgive me, and she does a whine in her voice. She does a tense shift. There's more illustration 
about the bar and where she went than there is about the violence going on again. If I'm going to be that, use that many illustrators, be that illustrative of what's going on, I'm probably gonna do some of the other piece. And then finally, what we see is what I always refer to as going down the well. And I've seen it in the interrogation room plenty of times, a person starts finding a way to feel worse and make themselves more emotional and curl up into a ball. And they do it all the time as a way to avoid the question, a way to avoid other things. And then I see her eye block, close her eyes at, as she starts talking about the struggle in the bar area. She's going down a well to prepare for this next thing that we'll, talk, we'll cover, but that's the second time. Something's up with that specific piece of body language. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is a rare time that I will stake my reputation on this. Uh, this is deception. You don't hear me say it often. In my opinion, this is deception. This is what it looks like. More remembering, she's saying there's some broken bottles on the floor. Forgets how, completely forgets. We'll, we'll memorize the type of wood the floors are made of in the house, the exact color and type of tiles, the table that she was thrown into, how many towels are in the dryer at that exact moment. I don't know how many details she can get except for how those bottles got broken. I think that we're, we're skipping over some details here. <clears throat> and I think she's obsessing with how, how destructive he is, and this is likely distancing language that she's the one who probably created this mess. And it looks like she's making accusations of the things that he is saying that she did. She's just redirecting every single accusation backward. She redirects again to her problems with sequence. And this is the only time we see this is, is when the detail needs to be inserted. It's uh, flashes. It's, there's an eye contact uh, flutter avoidance where the eyes are just fluttering like Greg's screen right now, just avoid it. Never had that happen, ever. <clears throat> and she's saying, I remember retreating, shifting back to the present. There's a bar behind me, I'm trapped. He's throwing these bottles one after the other. I remember bottle breaking, terrified, couldn't move. I believe that's when we got in the struggle. When she's saying all this detail, this added detail and pretend confusion are a very classic case that's often seen in cases of malingering and faking or pretending memories. It's right here in the textbook and they teach this. It's well reviewed. It's peer reviewed in multiple. I'm talking more than 50 academic articles that talk about this specific behavior and three or four of more of the behaviors that she's exhibiting here in this video that directly goes into fabricating stories and fabricating a mental illness, which is what we're seeing. Chase, if, if your reputation is going down, then mine's going with you. Because I, I have up here, big cluster of deception. And then over here, cluster of deception. I mean, it, it, it is just a massive, massive cluster of deception going on here. The only things I have to add into the list that everybody has given here is, look, we, we said right at the start that this disgust and disdain and some of the anger is a bit of a baseline for her. And I think there's a, that's, that's about personality or potentially, in my opinion, personality disorder, potentially. Um, but she masks it with her hand. She shows disgust and disdain, and then she does a mask and blocks, and then it shows again. So just another piece of deception there that, that we catch her in. There's clear self-monitoring around here, a clear understanding of, I'm gonna say something that might not be accurate and I really need to slow it down, work this out, protect myself, shade some of the feelings that I'm gonna have. So a big, big cluster there. And, and what a massively different story than Johnny Depp's. Um, so there's nothing really that aligns about the two. Now, of course, one person could be lying and the other person could be telling the truth, okay? But they were both there at the same time and there's zero, I would say, alignment about this story. Zero alignment, which is, which is really odd. Huge deception. There, I'm going down with you, Chase. I... Uh... I, I, I honestly don't remember if I um, threw anything in his direction. I, I 
don't think I did. Um, I just remember him having me by the nightgown. Um, I remember him flailing me, throwing me around. I'm flailing. Um, I, this is after um, there were some bottles broken on the floor. Uh, I think this is actually after, again, forgive me, I wish I could remember the sequence, but it's flashes. He's throwing these bottles at me. Um, I remember retreating. There were also cans, like uh, soda cans, beer or soda cans. And they're coming at me one after the other. And I keep pulling myself into the bar area. There's a bar behind me in like a, I don't know, like an L shape. He's standing in the only way you can exit. So I'm kind of trapped in front of the sink, surrounded by bar on three sides with him in front of me-ish kind of front off to the off to the left and he's throwing these bottles one after the other and I can feel glass breaking behind me I remember feeling um one of them go by my head really fast I mean the, a velocity a real velocity I remember being terrified I remember I couldn't move I couldn't go anywhere um I eventually I'm trying to I don't know, he ran out of things to throw. I think that's how I moved myself towards the exit. And I believe that's most likely when we got kind of in this struggle by the bar area. Um, I'm on the countertop. It had me by the neck. And he felt like he was on top of me. And I'm, lo I, I'm looking at him in his eyes. And I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him. It was black. I've never been so scared in my life. It was, it was black. I couldn't see him. And he was looking at me and I was trying to get through to him. I was trying to say to him in some way that it was me. I was trying to get through to Johnny. And I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him at all. And it, my head was bashing against the back of the bar and I couldn't breathe. And I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. My feet were slipping. My arms were slipping on the countertops. And I remember just trying to get up so I could breathe, so I could tell him that he was really hurting me. I didn't think he knew what he was doing. I don't know how... <sighs> I'm sorry. I, mean, I couldn't breathe. Please. I don't know. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand. I, 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 when I... The, the next thing I remember. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, obviously, uh, Johnny is experiencing anger. And we see that with his flared nostril, nostrils and that deep sniff he's taken. And uh, as for Amber, this is somebody who's who is trying to relay panic. She's panicked here, but she's not panicked because of what happened. She's not relaying the panic she went through. She's relaying the panic she's in now because she doesn't think anybody believes her at this point. I think she's realizing this thing's out of hand. And it's gotten away from her and she's panicked because uh like greg is because the jury isn't buying it and she creates tries to create this monster that's why there's so many breaks in there she doesn't know what to say she's decided i'm going in man i'm gonna go in with this all this crying and stuff and it's not working we're we're, we're not seeing any tears there's no runny nose nothing like that at all and i think greg's got some things about the the tissue 
that, that she's using. But we're we're not seeing the things we should see, and that's mainly the tears and the runny nose and uh, a red face. So she's trying to relay panic, which she's panicked, but she's not panicked about what she's talking about. She's panicked because she thinks she spent all this time doing this, and this is the crux of what's 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 supposed to have happened. It's peaking here you know, of how violent and how horrible he is and, how, and what he's done to her and her personality. We're supposed to watch her break down, but it's not working because if you watch this and you didn't get a little bit of a, not a, maybe not a giggle, but if you didn't think that was really, really, really odd, then I don't know what to tell you, but keep in mind, we're not saying we're, we're just talking about the body language we're seeing here. This is my opinion, nothing else. We know other people have gone through this and have it a lot worse than, than, then she's had it. Similar experiences and experiences a hundred thousand times worse than this that do experience this. But I don't think that's what we're seeing here. I don't think she's experiencing that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm just going to hit a couple of things because I think you hit a lot of them and I want to leave a couple. You do see him showing stress movement and breathing and upset and eye contact. She's going down the well. She's doing that thing where she works herself down into a darker and darker place. I'll leave the eyes are black and all that stuff to you guys. She does cover her face like you would expect for a person who is going through something emotional. However, when a person is going through really emotional situations and, and really boiling down, typically they're going to break eye contact. They're not going to make hard eye contact as they're telling you the story. She does that. The other weird one for me is she raises her thing to wipe her face and she goes here. It's up here between her eyes. It's not patting an eye. It's not covering her nose. If I were going to put some chemical, menthol, any kind of menthol item to make my eyes water, I would probably dab it right in the middle of my nose, not in my eye. Not saying that's what she's done, but it seems out of place. It seems like something is not right in terms of the overall delivery. And then she does this padding in between her nose. People have asked, did she snort something? Possible she put something in her nostril to make her nose snot up and all that kind of thing. But she shows little private time around something so emotional. And then the, la the other weird one, she immediately goes from that terror face back to her baseline, that kind of negativity face. It's immediate, it's that quick. We don't see that usually. We see lingering and hanging on from there. Chase, what do you got? Back to present shift again. She's, I'm, I'm on the countertop, had, had me by, by the, the neck. neck. There's past tense, a backwards past tense shift to past with no pronoun. There's no he had me by the neck. And when people have less pronouns, they're more likely to be deceptive. And that's proven. I felt, felt like he was on top of me. me. Well, was he? We, we don't know. And now it's back to the present moment. I'm what looking in his, his eyes. eyes. I think this is partially truthful from seeing him at other times. So I'm thinking that she's pulling in data from a different experience into this current experience here. Uh, she's overacting the sadness, and this is a line that she wants them to really feel. She's making eye contact with as many jurors as she possibly can. The sadness disappears and reappears from her face, which you do not see. We've all conducted tens of thousands of hours of these interviews. I've never seen it. Don't know about you guys. Sadness mm -hmm. disappearing and reappearing suddenly. Super weird. And her, she says, my head was bashing against the back of the bar. No perpetrator there. She doesn't talk about who was doing that. So that's distancing language. And she's describing basically a scene from Die Hard. There's no injuries. She's describing somebody who was punched, slammed onto a bar, thrown across broken glass, naked, walked across this broken glass, naked, and then emerged without a single scratch on their body. It's, it's Bruce Willis is what we're seeing here. And then again, there's no tears <clears throat> whatsoever. Shifting emotions that are back and forth. And then she mouths the F word. Uh, with her apology, with a disgust expression. And I'll let you be the judge of what she's really disgusted about, that inwardly focused or maybe outwardly focused. But right at the very end of this clip, you'll see this little elbow movement here with both of her elbows, and that's a ventilation gesture. You're more likely to see that after a person is going through something that's very stressful. But keep in mind, deception is very stressful, especially when you know that there's a camera on you and that whatever you do in that moment is going to live in perpetuity. I'm feeling it right now because I'm on YouTube. Uh, I'm not. Mark. My camera's letting me down.
<laughs> Stay with us, Greg. Stay with us. We're almost we're almost there. Um, yes, I agree, Chase. It felt like he was on top of me. Well, yeah, that feeling may well be true, but it doesn't mean the actual physical act was actually happening. Though the feeling of somebody on top of you could absolutely be true doesn't mean it's actually happening. Uh, I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him, it was Black. Now this for me is really important that at this point in the story, uh, Johnny disappears. She's creating this narrative, this idea that Johnny has, has gone. I've never been so scared in my life it was black. So she's entered in, now uh, this is past tense again. So again, now I'm worried. You remember right at the start, I was saying, hey, you know, somebody's experienced trauma, they can be in, in present tense talking about history. This is the moment when she's never been so scared in her life and it's now fully in past tense. So it doesn't make any sense. This would be the moment where you'd go, I'm scared for my life. Yeah, it's black. Yeah. Now, what is this idea of the blackness and Johnny disappearing at this point? I think this is an this is a strategy. She should know, and her counsel should well know that Johnny Depp. The, the jury are going to be biased towards Johnny Depp. They are, of course they are, for all kinds of reasons. They're, the best jury in the world is going to like Johnny Depp more than they like Amber. If we were to gamble on that, you know, there's so many reasons why that shouldn't be true, but I think it's a fair gamble that it's going to be true. And so we need to give that jury an excuse to go against him. If Amber's to win this one, we need to give them a, an excuse to go against him. Well, what if he's not there? What if it's not Johnny? It's just like Johnny's body. It's just his body is there. John is gone and he's kind of possessed. It's almost demonic possession or he's disappeared. Well, as a jury, we could then go, yeah, I think he was you know, domestically violent, uh, but it's not really him. So we haven't really said anything bad about Johnny Depp because we don't want to say anything bad about Johnny Depp. I think it's a, it's potentially a really smart tactic to try and get some kind of bias back from the jury and maybe the public as well. So interesting. But of course, I think what happens because it's it's now in the world of demonic possession, it's now hit the level of horror movie. And she has to create this melodramatic story, melodramatic performance to make that horror movie level of I looked into the blackness and Johnny was gone and all there was was the abyss in front of me. She's got to create a big performance around that. And it and that's not I think her style, uh, that's not the way she does really well uh, as a performer. So it doesn't really work for her, in my opinion. I'm on the countertop. He had me by the neck. And he felt like he was on top of me. And I'm, lo I, I'm looking at him in his eyes. And I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him. It was black. I've never been so scared in my life. It was, it was black. I couldn't see him. And he was looking at me and I was trying to get through to him. I was trying to say to him in some way that it was me. I was trying to get through to Johnny. And I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him at all. And it, my head was bashing against the back of the bar and I couldn't breathe. And I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. My feet were slipping. My arms were slipping on the countertops. And I remember just trying to get up so I could breathe, so I could tell him that he was really hurting me. I didn't think he knew what he was doing. I don't know how... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, mean, I couldn't breathe. Please. I don't know. Please, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. 
I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get through to him. I couldn't, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand. <laughs> I, 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 when I, the, the next thing I remember. You said he hit you, and he wear he was he was wearing rings, right, Miss Heard? So he hit you with rings on every finger. I don't know if I've ever known Johnny to not wear rings. Yeah. <clears throat> Ms. Hurd, you testified to an incident in March of 2013 where Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times. Do you recall that? That's correct. And you testified, quote, you don't know how many times he hit you in the face. That's correct. So Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times while he was wearing rings on this occasion, correct? Which occasion in March are you referencing? You weren't The specific. testimony that you gave on day 15 of this trial March of 2013, you weren't specific as to the day. There were several incidents. The one where he hit you several times in the face. Uh, there were, there were so, I'm sorry, just so I understand better. There were several incidents in March. Which one are you asking me about? The time that he hit you several times in the face wearing rings. Well, he pretty in much March always- March of 2013. Right. What are you asking me, I'm sorry? He was wearing rings on that occasion? I pretty much always knew him to wear rings. Okay, let's please pull up Defendant's Exhibit 170A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. You testified that this is a picture you took after that incident, right, Ms. Hurd? Yes, that was one where he grabbed me. And hit you in the face so many times that you don't remember. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that so you lost count with rings on, your fi on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention other than my therapist all right mark what do you got yeah so vocal clicks which are the things that go like this before somebody talks and we're going to hear a lot of those from amber heard and we hear a lot during this now what does that mean in my view when i hear those i'm always looking out that there may be some stress around what's about to come does it mean somebody's being deceptive no not at all but with other clusters of information that we're going to get it starts to become a larger probability and that's what we're dealing with here is the probability that somebody is being de de uh, deceptive not the actual fact that it's that it's happening uh, another one that I would put in that cluster, she does not state that he hit her with rings on. That's never stated. What she says is, I don't know if I've ever known Johnny to not wear rings. Well, look, I'm not saying she hasn't been hit and I'm not saying she has been hit. But if you had been hit, my probability would be on saying he hit me with rings on. That's where my mind would go. That's where I'd expect other people's minds to go. Now, we all know with violence going on, all kinds of things can happen in somebody's psychology. But all of that said, we've got um, almost never and a double negative. Now, there's nothing wrong with a double negative, but there's easier ways to say yes than not no. Okay? And, and, and if somebody's taking the difficult way around to something that suggests to me they're making a journey that they don't really need to make and why are they making that journey why are they having to circumnavigate such an easy route to a to a yes to that so alarm bells go off for me on that one scott what do you think 
All right, I think this is a situation where the witness prep uh, got a little bit out of hand. I think she went too far into it, and she's trying to be to do exactly what they said. She's repeating the answer, so it sounds odd. She's it, the whole thing just sounds weird, and nobody said, "Hey, listen, man, you need to dial it down a notch," from when they from when they took a break or something, because that's just too much. I mean, she it just her answers sound odd as she's going through that. She still answers all the questions; they're still short, tight, to the point. And I think she's beginning to realize her her snarkiness isn't working on this attorney, and that's starting to bug her a little bit. Um, and she's not sure how to go forward since it's not working, um, so she can guard her ego properly, or the way it should be guarded, so she doesn't end up uh, freaking out and blowing up on her. So that's what I got. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So with this witness prep, I, Scott, I think the reason that so much coaching is involved in this is because there's one thing they can't tell her. Just tell the truth, mm. which is what a lawyer should be telling their client. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but let, let's uh, let's break this one down in reverse Quentin Tarantino order, which means in regular order. She smiles corrects the expression to artificial sadness, then looks at the jury to display it to them. Then she looks back at the counsel with a cold, emotionless face. This is in like two seconds, this sh rapid shift of emotion. And <clears throat> right at this moment, Mr. Depp hits you in the face multiple times. This look to the jury here is horrifying to me, personally horrifying, watching it this morning. It was before the sun came up. It was dark in my office. I was a little scared. There's a weird, awkward smile while putting her head down. Then she looks back at counsel, at the counsel with no emotion, then back to the jury with a sad face. In my opinion, body language and behavior profiling is a lot like meteorology. It's based in science and gives you likelihood, where we deal in terms of likelihood. But this is a rare occasion where I'm going to say there's a 99 and maybe a 100% chance of precipitation here, which is, I mean deception. There's no emotion, no willingness to insert details on top of her answers, which is her baseline. And the jury, I think, are all unconsciously processing this nonverbal behavior. So in reality, there in the courtroom, the jury is processing her behavior through this mammalian part of our brain. We've been communicating nonverbally for a million years. And they see these little rapid shifts in emotion, and it sends a signal, which gives us what we call a gut feeling. Since that part of the brain doesn't speak English, we're like, something is off. But it's likely nobody can really put their finger on it because that the mammalian part of our brain doesn't really speak English. So when we see something off, we get that gut feeling. And that's all I got. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'll add on top of your clusters as I go through this, but I got a handful of things to talk about. Number one, there's that swivel switch. Turns her head or brow rises every time she looks at, at the jury. If you don't think she's working the jury, then pay attention to the fact she looks at the jury when she's asking a clarifying question. That would not happen if she was not working the jury. Now, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. And she's probably been, probably been prepped by her counsel that she needs to make a contact with that jury. I'll also tell you, I think, Mark, you hit a couple of things dead on right there with these vocal tics and the lip compression come out around an emotional issue. I think she's containing, and I think what we're seeing here is well prepared to prevent her from doing what she did on the stand in 2016 or on the deposition in 2016, where she was snarky and talking down and aggressive. You don't want that coming out here. So if I'm, if I'm the person who's prepping her, I'd say that's correct is a fine answer. Don't be snarky. That's correct. That's incorrect. You can see that she has absolute, there are a handful of things that we know that we can read. She has contempt, and this is not her usual drawn back left side of her mouth, is full bore contempt when she looks at that attorney. She does a light sway. We're talking about clusters now, so we start to see things. She does a light sway as they're asking her questions about punching. Mark, again, you had it dead on. She avoided anything about did he hit you with rings on? Well, he had rings on. Okay. She also used a provocative statement, a provocative statement saying there were several incidents. And a provocative statement is a way to get your part of the story out by having the person ask you the next question. John Nolan, confidential. He's a master. He was my, my instructor to teach me all of that. So you look at those pieces, you start to say, okay, we've got clusters here now. She's avoiding a question. She says that's correct. We see she's locked down. 
She does that provocative statement, trying to give you more information, trying to take you off path. She does some discomfort in her movement, meaning it's rigid, it isn't fluid. We associate that with fight or flight. So all that together, now we start to say, can we tell she's lying? No, but we would certainly want to go after her and this attorney wants to go after her. That's it. You said he hit you and he wear, he, he was wearing rings, right, Ms. Heard? So he hit you with rings on every finger? I don't know if I've ever known Johnny to not wear rings. Yeah. <clears throat> Ms. Hurd, you testified to an incident in March of 2013 where Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times. Do you recall that? That's correct. And you testified, quote, you don't know how many times he hit you in the face. That's correct. So Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times while he was wearing rings on this occasion, correct? Which occasion in March are you referencing? You weren't The specific. testimony that you gave on day 15 of this trial March of 2013, you weren't specific as to the day. There were several incidents. The one where he hit you several times in the face. Uh, there were, there were so, I'm sorry, just so I understand better. There were several incidents in March. Which one are you asking me about? The time that he hit you several times in the face wearing rings. Well, he pretty in much March always- March of 2013. Right. What are you asking me, I'm sorry? He was wearing rings on that occasion? I pretty much always knew him to wear rings. Okay, let's please pull up Defendant's Exhibit 170A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. You testified that this is a picture you took after that incident, right, Ms. Hurd? Yes, that was one where he grabbed me. And hit you in the face so many times that you don't remember. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that so you lost count with rings on, your on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention other than my therapist. Ms. Hurd, you testified that in January of 2015, there was an incident in Tokyo before uh, Mr. Depp's Mordecai, the film Mordecai's premiere. Is that correct? That's correct. And you told this jury that on this occasion, Mr. Depp was kneeling on your back. That's correct, in the closet. And you also told this jury that you wore a backless dress to the Mordecai premiere that very same night. I did. And you testified that you were checking for bruises in the car on the way back, on the way to the event to make sure that there, there were, quote, no visible marks, right? I was checking on my phone um, after the event to see, to make sure that nothing, they couldn't see anything. Your testimony was that you were checking in the car on the way to the event to make sure that there were no marks on your back. Uh, Perhaps I misspoke or I misunderstood. It was on the way back from it was after I was concerned. After, you know, concerned that there would be marks in any photographs since we were being photographed at Johnny's press event. And you didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean, I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. I assume you have it. I do. Um, let's please pull up plaintiff's exhibit 1256. <coughs> this is a picture of you and Mr. Depp, or the back of you, at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, correct, Ms. Hurd? That is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish this picture. All right, 1256 in evidence. This is you in the backless dress at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, right? That is correct. You would agree that there are no bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture? No, not that I could see. 
right, I'll go first on this one. This is one of the largest micro expressions of anger I've ever seen. And when she says the word after, her entire face shows anger. You can slow it down, take a look at it. It's huge and you saw it. You may not realize it, but you did see it. And it shows, she shows her lower teeth, that chin juts outward and her brows furrow. Everything, she squints, everything shows anger on that. It's very brief, really, really brief. It's micro expression. And it actually happens twice, right there when she says after and then right there, right after it. And then on the word concern, we're seeing anger as well and all the hallmarks of anger in that spot. Uh, I think this is a fantastic study of full on full facial micro expressions because these are every now and then you'll see them like in the in the uh, O.J. Simpson case. What's that, that little fellow's name that had the long hair that that uh, Kato. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Kato Kalin. Uh, we saw him him uh, with some anger as well in there a couple of times. I remember um, I think it was Ekman that put a couple of things out, or maybe it was Joe put a couple, uh, Joe Navarro put a couple of things out, uh, pictures where he just captured it, that anger face. But I remember that like it was yesterday. But that's what this reminds me of. And I'm going to pull those actually and use it for training. They're so good. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Here we are with a swivel switch again. Turn her head, brow goes up. Turn her head, brow goes up. She says that's correct and qualifies in the closet. Well, I don't know why in the closet matters, but that's to her baseline because she gives us more information when something is actually going on. She said, I did, and that's in baseline. She does that kind of scrunched face. That eyelid flutter that starts is recognition that she's about to have to answer a question about wearing a backless dress after she had been beaten up. So I think she knows that, she sees it. And then when she tries to get away from the question, she narrows her eyes and does a feigned misunderstanding so she can say, I don't know what you mean. She purses her lips, makes eye contact with the jury, and then goes back to the attorney with, I have not had the opportunity. And she raises her shoulders in helplessness. That's all congruent messaging. So we think, well, that's at least looks truthful. A lot of this other stuff doesn't. But then we see another uncertainty as her brow knits. And she says, I assume you have the photo. Well, yeah, that's not what you want to see. But of course she does. And then that's it for this one. There's there's so much going on in this story. But she is working the jury the way she's been told. She's doing correct. I did very short answers to prevent doing the wrong thing. And Mark, I think this goes back to your cognitive control thing about doodling or doing something else. If you can remember, I always say curl your toes in your shoes, the mere fact that you're remembering what you've been told brings your thinking brain back online and keeps you from switching over into limbic thought. Chase, what do you got? If these uh, <clears throat> sketches ever appear on eBay, I'm probably going to just splurge and, and get one. But again, here we're seeing this weird face making for the jury display. And I do think, in my opinion, and this is all my opinion, it's a display. There's, when this picture comes out of the screen of this backless dressed, this uh, ability that you're witnessing here is either the only human on earth who can go through several emotions in mere seconds, or the most talented emotional manipulator that you might ever see. It's my opinion. It's jury, sad victim, attorney, cold, calculating. Jury, smile, back to the attorney, cold. Just during that one piece. And that's all I'm going to focus on is this rapid shift of emotion. And what we're seeing here is not really testimony. We're seeing a performance that's directed at an audience at very specific times, looking at them, scanning the jury, which you can see in this video. See if you can spot it. There's a moment there where the jury is being scanned during a question to see how they're responding to that question by Ms. Heard. Was I the last one? Nope. Oh, sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Lovely. Thank you. So uh, let me tie a few of those things together because we've talked a lot about the anger, the contempt, the disgust that we're seeing popping up. But we have to recognize that that's part of her baseline. In the first one of the first videos we did of Amber Heard, we saw that popping up when she wasn't under stress. And so you might think, well, great, that's probably a good thing for her that it's part of her baseline and we might be able to discount some of those elements a little bit. Well, unfortunately, probably not, because there's a 
study out of Switzerland. It's just one study, so uh, you can count it or discount it. But it found a massive correlation between the, the, um, the emotions shown in the face of anger, contempt and disgust, and something called borderline personality disorder. Now, borderline is different for different people, uh, and so, you know, you won't see this in everybody, but in this particular, this particular paper, they saw a good correlation. Now, I'm not conflating uh, borderline with histrionic. They're two different things, but you can have both of them at the same time as well. And so all of this is pointing towards potentially quite a difficult person to be around. Not impossible, but difficult to be around. And so I think we should keep that in mind that there may well be, the thing is with, with emotions popping up in people's faces, when they pop up now and again, most emotions don't last really much more than I would say 10 minutes because it's quite hard work for the body to deal with. Okay? When they pop up for longer than 10 minutes, we tend to call that a mood. Somebody's got into a bit of a mood. It won't be high intensity, but it lasts a long time. And moods can last for hours or parts of, of days. But usually when somebody wakes up the next morning, that's why it's sometimes good to sleep on it. When somebody wakes up the next morning, a whole bunch of calcium has moved to another side of a neuron and, and things are kind of forgotten about. And you can't kind of be like, well, what was that problem that I had yesterday? You can't quite remember it. Now, if the mood goes on for a long, 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 long time, days and maybe weeks and even months, we tend to say that that might be an affective disorder and we'll start to see the same behaviors in people day after day after day. And then we might start to move it towards, well, maybe it's a personality disorder. So I just wanted to bring that up. You will see all of these things in her baseline, but that might point towards an affective disorder or a personality disorder in my little opinion there. Where, where are you, Mark? Where are you? I am in Banff. I'm in Banff in Canada, in Calgary. If you could see out the windows there, you would see magnificent mountains snow capped with incredible trees. But what you're seeing here is basically any Fairmont hotel that you've ever been in, in your life. You'll recognize these lamps from any Fairmont that you've ever been in. Almost home. Almost like my hotel a few weeks ago. <laughs> Ms. Heard, you testified that in January of 2015, there was an incident in Tokyo before uh, Mr. Depp's Mordecai, the film Mordecai's premiere. Is that correct? That's correct. And you told this jury that on this occasion, Mr. Depp was kneeling on your back. That's correct, in the closet. And you also told this jury that you wore a backless dress to the Mordecai premiere that very same night. I did. And you testified that you were checking for bruises in the car on the way back on the way to the event to make sure that there, there were quote no visible marks right i was checking on my phone um after the event to see to make sure that nothing they couldn't see anything your testimony was that you were checking in the car on the way to the event to make sure that there were no marks on your back uh, Perhaps I misspoke or I misunderstood. It was on the way back from it was after I was concerned. After, you know, concerned that there would be marks in any photographs since we were being photographed at Johnny's press event. And you didn't show this jury a picture of you in that backless dress though, did you? Um, I don't know what you mean, I'm sorry. You didn't show this jury a picture of you at the Mordecai premiere wearing a backless dress, did you? I haven't had the opportunity to. Okay. I assume you have it. I do. Um, let's please pull up plaintiff's exhibit 1256. <laughs> this is a picture of you and Mr. Depp, or the back of you, at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, correct, Ms. Hurd? That is correct. Your Honor, I move to admit and publish this picture. All right, 1256 in evidence. This is you in the backless dress at the Mordecai premiere in Tokyo, right? That is correct. You would agree that there are no bruises or visible marks on your back in this picture? No, not that I could see. Directing your attention, Ms. Heard, to 
the photograph. This is the photograph you took in March of 2013, right? That is correct. And this was taken at your apartment in Orange? Yes. And this is your breakfast table? That is correct. And it's your testimony that Mr. Depp left this breakfast table just the way you took it? That is correct. So this is what the table looked like after Mr. Depp had been doing cocaine? Uh, well, clearly he has yet to snort these lines. There are four lines of cocaine on this table, right, Ms. Hurd? In this picture, I see four lines. There isn't any cocaine residue around those lines, right? Uh, I, not that I can tell, no. Doesn't really look like anyone's been doing cocaine off that table, does it? With all due respect, I'm not sure you know how that works. I'm asking if you do. You've testified you've done cocaine. I have. Doesn't really look like Mr. Depp or anyone was doing cocaine off that table, does it? Uh, I beg to differ with you on that. When you snort cocaine, typically it goes into your nose. And then it doesn't stay residue. on the table. There's residue from that cocaine when your lips and nose touch the table, right? Will the tampon applicator next to um, the credit, I mean, um, driver's license that you see is a device that uh, I believe my sister had taught him to use in order to put the cocaine uh, in your nose. Mr. Depp is a pretty heavy smoker, right? He is. And and that's a cigarette in the ashtray in the back there? Um, back right? Yes, it looks like one of his hand rolls. There's no other cigarettes in that ashtray, are there? I see one cigarette. The one that's not smoked? That's correct. There's no ash in that ashtray either, is there? Uh, not that I can tell in this picture. It's pretty clean. In this picture, it looks like it, yes. It's a pretty neat table. Wouldn't you agree? Um, depends on what you would call neat, I suppose. And you sent this picture to your friend, Rocky Pennington, as well, didn't you? I sure did. And when you sent it, you said, quote, look at my morning, or something like that. Is that right? Yay for mornings. So you have a habit of sending stage photographs to your friend Rocky, don't you? I had a habit of communicating with my best friend about what was going on in my life. You don't have any pictures of Mr. Depp actually consuming cocaine, do you? I don't think I have a picture of him mid-snort. No. You don't even have any pictures of Mr. Depp with cocaine. What do you mean by that? Holding cocaine, standing next to cocaine? Um, Sitting next to cocaine? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you haven't shown any of those pictures like that to the jury, have you? I don't know. I No, I haven't. And you were never able to catch Mr. Depp with cocaine on film either, were you? I never tried. But you were able to catch him sleeping, right? Uh, I have seen him pass out in all sorts of places, yes. Chase, what do you got? These are some rapid and quick answers. And then we're seeing after these, in the beginning here, we see some backpedaling, some not answering questions at all. So one thing I will continuously tell since you're subscribing as we speak, you're going to hear this quite often. What's being concealed in the story? Is there emotion? Is there detail? Is there sensory detail? What's being concealed or removed from a person's story? So instead of just lo looking at the verbal stuff, the nonverbal stuff, what's being hidden in the story? Right when she says, not that I can tell, no, this is the most uh, strongest indicator of anger that's not the anger facial expression that I could possibly see. And this is a dominant shoulder retreat. The dominant shoulder starts moving away from the person that's asking questions. Because I think as this next question is loading, she knows where it's going. And there's a lot of lower teeth exposure here. And right when she's saying, I have a habit of communicating to my best friend, there's some closed eye talking going on there, which typically indicates in some people pretentious feelings of or self-pride. 
And you haven't shown any pictures to that jury. We hear that elicitation statement in there again, uh, John Nolan. It, this is another bizarre expression, uh, kind of flashed to the jury. You can watch it right on her face. You can see it. The video is going to come up as soon as we're done. It flashes to the jury. And I want to talk really quickly about true and false facial expressions. True facial expressions will fade off of the screen or fade off of a person's face over time. A false facial expression is more likely to drop or fall off the face quickly. But throughout this whole thing, she's failing to answer questions. A lot of these questions are kind of like designed to sound snarky on purpose. I'm not sure. I think they could have been worded a little bit better, but I think she's doing a great job either way. Staging photos question is like, I think a way it could have been asked is like, is your testimony here today? that you didn't adjust a single aspect or detail of a single object on this table before taking this photograph. And that might elicit a, a different response. Mark, what do you think? Here's what I'm most interested on this. Uh, no pictures of Johnny with cocaine, but pictures of Johnny passed out, or as he calls it, napping. Now, we've already heard from Amber this idea of uh, cocaine is is taking cocaine is pretty cool because she sends pictures to her friend going yay it's the morning this is me on my morning okay this is a cool morning to to be had um but she doesn't take pictures of johnny doing cool stuff like that she takes pictures of johnny passed out or asleep i believe because that's embarrassing and not cool when you get to a certain age and you can't handle your drugs like you used to be able to do as a young rock and roller, gets a bit embarrassing. And so these are, I think, opportunities for Amber to get evidence of the old man, of uh, the, the disheveled, past it rock and roller, which will obviously raise her status as his goes down and think about a personality that might like to raise their own status. And if they can't have their status high, well, they just need to lower other people's and have evidence of that to bring theirs up. Interesting stuff. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, one thing that you'll notice in this case that is missing, she has been very engaging with the jury up to now. And you'll notice she starts off engaging the jury with that switch. She looks over, her brow rises again. And then she forgets that as she starts to get in a bind. She shows some absolute contempt and some disgust as she engages the, the attorney after she first looks over to these guys and goes, well, clearly you don't understand or whatever her words were there. And she's trying to bring the jury along with her, but suddenly she steps into that trap. And I think, Mark, you're dead on. The attorney uses naivete, which means I'm feigning not to understand a complex thing. So you explain it to me. It, it preys on our natural instinct to teach. So what you're doing is that she then starts to spill information and she has a rational response for why there is no no residue left and that kind of thing. And then as she's moving through that, you can't miss that she forgets to engage the jury for a long period of time in there. That means she's fallen into this and her brain is working on whatever the problem is. And I think she starts to realize then that she's fallen into this. You watch her stretch her neck in some awkward kind of craned around, let me see, as she's trying to answer that's correct. She moves her neck around to say, let me see, and her whole body moves in an awkward fashion and she's stiff. It means her brain is starting to register there's a threat. You see her shrink, she does a shrinking target, what you guys have always called turtling, I just call shrinking target. And she actually asks a question that I think she's asking for real clarification when she says, what do you mean by that? Because I think she's doing a little bit of squirrel in the road. I think her brain is going, oh, 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 what do I do now? When she's asked, do you have pictures of Johnny? She does, it looks like she's looking at the jury, but she isn't. What she does is she first goes to her visual accessing side and starts looking for, hey, do I remember pictures? Are there possibly pictures? Uh, and you can see that's when she's scrambling in the road and then she purses her lips in disapproval. This is a place where it looks like to me she's fallen into it and she's kind of in a bind and it's maybe the first place we're seeing her actually starting to come 
to realize that this woman is actually a threat. The rest of it, I think she's been pretty prim, pretty you know direct with her and kind of short and snarky. And I think here she fell for something she shouldn't have. I agree with you, Mark. Directing your attention, Ms. Heard, to a photograph. This is a photograph you took in March of 2013, right? That is correct. And this was taken at your apartment in Orange? Yes. And this is your breakfast table? That is correct. And it's your testimony that Mr. Depp left this breakfast table just the way you took it? That is correct. So this is what the table looked like after Mr. Depp had been doing cocaine? Uh, well, clearly he has yet to snort these lines. There are four lines of cocaine on this table, right, Ms. Hurd? In this picture, I see four lines. There isn't any cocaine residue around those lines, right? Uh, I, not that I can tell, no. Doesn't really look like anyone's been doing cocaine off that table, does it? With all due respect, I'm not sure you know how that works. I'm asking if you do. You've testified you've done cocaine. I have. Doesn't really look like Mr. Depp or anyone was doing cocaine off that table, does it? Uh, I beg to differ with you on that. When you snort cocaine, typically it goes into your nose. And then it doesn't stay residue. on the table. There's residue from that cocaine when your lips and nose touch the table, right? Will the tampon applicator next to um, the credit, I mean, um, driver's license that you see is a device that uh, I believe my sister had taught him to use in order to put the cocaine uh, in your nose. Mr. Depp is a pretty heavy smoker, right? He is. And and that's a cigarette in the ashtray in the back there? Um, back right? Yes, it looks like one of his hand rolls. There's no other cigarettes in that ashtray, are there? I see one cigarette. The one that's not smoked? That's correct. There's no ash in that ashtray either, is there? Uh, not that I can tell in this picture. It's pretty clean. In this picture, it looks like it, yes. It's a pretty neat table. Wouldn't you agree? Um, depends on what you would call neat, I suppose. And you sent this picture to your friend, Rocky Pennington, as well, didn't you? I sure did. And when you sent it, you said, quote, look at my morning, or something like that. Is that right? Yay for mornings. So you have a habit of sending stage photographs to your friend Rocky, don't you? I had a habit of communicating with my best friend about what was going on in my life. You don't have any pictures of Mr. Depp actually consuming cocaine, do you? I don't think I have a picture of him mid-snort. No. You don't even have any pictures of Mr. Depp with cocaine. What do you mean by that? Holding cocaine, standing next to cocaine? Um, Sitting next to cocaine? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you haven't shown any of those pictures like that to the jury, have you? I don't know. I No, I haven't. And you were never able to catch Mr. Depp with cocaine on film either, were you? I never tried. But you were able to catch him sleeping, right? Uh, I have seen him pass out in... All sorts of places, yes. You testified under oath that, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote, didn't you? That's correct. I pledged the entirety. No. Ms. Heard, my questions. Your counsel will have time to redirect you after. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That is correct, I pledged the entirety. I'm gonna to move to strike everything after yes. Uh, all right. There's nothing to strike here. No. Ms. Hurt, this is really inappropriate. I'll sustain the objection and we'll just move forward. Thank you. Let's move forward. Next question. Under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it, Ms. Hurt? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question, sorry. You testified under oath, quote, 
the entirety of my divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That statement wasn't true. It is true. I pledged the entirety to charity. The statement... When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for Hurt, the entire house Hurt, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking, time. Ms. Hurt. All right, next question, please. Thank you. That statement isn't true today, as you sit here today, is it? It is true. I pledged the entirety. But you didn't charity. donate it. Unfortunately, you didn't donate it. It's a yes or no. I haven't been able to obligate. I mean, to fulfill those. So that's a no, right, Ms. Hurd? I am. I made the pledge. I want to be very clear. I pledged the entirety. I haven't been able to fulfill those pledges because I've been sued. You had all of the seven million dollars for 13 months before Mr. Depp sued you and you chose not to pay it to the charities you pledged it to. Is that I, correct? Ms. I Hurt? disagree with your characterization of that. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'll try to keep this one as tight as I can. She starts off with a real hard contempt face looking at the attorney. She conditions the question. Here we go again. Instead of saying she donated, she said, I pledged. Then she she goes to eye blocking. The attorney puts her on notice and starts to illustrate and tell her exactly what to do. And then I, one of my favorite parts of anything we've seen is she gets to this emotional head tilt where her heads, eyes are down to the right. Lips are drawn and her eyes are narrow. That's pre-conflict body language all day. If you can't recognize that, you're probably going to get in an argument with someone today. Then she conditions the question again with I pledged. Then she goes to hard eye contact, low blink rate because she realizes this is a threat. And then this is her saying what she thinks she's going to be able to get away with and she doesn't. She goes to full on rejection. Desmond Morris tongue jut for rejection, her chin out in defiance. She changes her cadence, and then she's full of contempt and sarcasm as she's working her way through. Her blink rate increases, and then the final blow is she conditions a question, softens the question, and distances the question with, I disagree with your, disagree with your characterization, characterization of that. that. Now, what's happening here is all that stuff that these attorneys have caused her to put in place to cover up 2016 amber has slipped and we're starting to see 2016 amber slide out of here chase what do you got yeah one thing you'll notice is she's using the same tactics around avoiding truth around donation as she is around all the instances of violence and right when the judge says let's move forward right here i want you to watch this i think heard thinks that her games are working and wrongly assumes that the sustained objection means that her attorney won. I do think that that's exactly what we're seeing. She sits upright. There's condescension on the face. The chin goes up. This is a challenge behavior. She's showing genuine joy in the game that's going on right now with this word salad testimony. And we can upgrade this maybe to Mark's favorite word. It might be a word lasagna. <laughs> But under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it misheard? So we hear that from the opposing counsel. And I want you to watch the eye flutter. This is strange because it really stands out here. And this helps her to delay the process and continue the game of deception that I believe she is genuinely enjoying, in my opinion. And when she says, I disagree with your characterization of that, there's a dismissive head tilt. She feels, I think, entitled and almost proud to have learned these new methods of linguistic manipulation. And those words are from her attorneys. I would, I would bet on it, at least $4. <laughs> on a side note, this stone cold attorney uh, sitting next to Depp is finally showing some emotion. This is the first time we're seeing him do anything. I think the entire courtroom is in disbelief right here and how someone could weave such a deep rooted web so openly and, and blatantly. And it might help us to ask ourselves the question, what kind of person would be comfortable doing all of this? Scott, what do you got? All right. I think she knows she's busted. And that's where her nose goes up and that chin goes out and she looks down her nose at the attorney. And almost every blink, like you were talking about, Chase, every blink is a double blink. It's really, really odd. It's really, really odd because she does the eye lash flutter, the eye blink flutter and all that uh, earlier on. But this time, every one of them is a, is a double. So I think that's, that's something to point out there that just lets us know her stress is just jacked really hard. And at the same time, when she looks back and forth from the jury, we see that head. When she turns, her head does a thing where it goes back and forth like this. 
as this little sort of wavering thing back and forth. I think that's an adapter. Any repetitive behavior, we see that as an adapter, a way to get rid of that built up stress or tension. And she's really tense and really stressed right here. And I think that's what's happening. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so negotiating the criteria here, it's argumentative and it is um, semantic. It's a semantic uh, word lasagna, I, th I think there. But I actually think that's what she's doing is has some reasonable nature to it at a semantic level. And she is accurate that in large gift giving, you don't give it all at once. Just in the same way, however, that Anna Sorokin was accurate when she said rich people borrow money. That's true as well, okay? But really what's happening here is, is the trying to get out of that timeline of you didn't give all the money immediately. Well, I pledged it, yeah, but you didn't give it. So there's a semantic argument going on here. Um, Johnny Depp's uh, kind of sidekick there, who, who's, a, who's an interesting little character, doesn't seem to do very much apart from this moment where he suddenly realizes he has a piece of information about the timeline line and he's just desperate to give it and so when he gives it across and he hears uh, the um, the questioner the examiner read out uh, what he's put forward he's there nodding his head and when it doesn't beat her because she is gonna argue this one to the very very last because that's the kind of person she is and and it's to her benefit to keep on arguing this one when he it doesn't go his way he simply can't believe it he's like he's a shock with the rest of the court like i can't believe this is going on but i think there is something quite reasonable in some ways about what's going on here in a court but you wouldn't want this kind of arguing day to day outside of a court because that could get really taxing on a day-to-day -day basis and it may be that this particular personality might do this kind of argument on a daily basis which could be quite taxing yeah that's all i got on this one all right you testified under oath that quote the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity end quote didn't you that's correct i pledged the entirety no. Ms. Heard, my questions. Your counsel will have time to redirect you after. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That is correct. I pledged the entirety. I'm going to move to strike everything after yes. Uh, all right. There's nothing to strike here. No. Ms. Hurt, this I is really it, inappropriate. I, I'll sustain the objection and we'll just move forward. Thank Let's you. Let's move forward. Next Thank question. You. Under oath, that statement wasn't true, was it, Ms. Hurd? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question. Sorry. You testified under oath, quote, the entirety of my divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote. That statement wasn't true. It is true. I pledged the entirety to charity. The statement. When you say you buy a house, you don't pay Ms. for the Heard, entire house Heard, at one time. You pay it I'm over not asking, time. Ms. Heard. All right, next question, please. Thank you. That statement isn't true today, as you sit here today, is it? It is true. I pledged the entirety. But you didn't charity. donate it. Unfortunately, you didn't donate it. It's a yes or no. I haven't been able to obligate, I mean, to fulfill those So that's a no, right, Ms. Heard? I, am, I made the pledge. I want to be very clear. I pledged the entirety. I haven't been able to fulfill those pledges because I've been sued. You had all of the $7 million for 13 months before Mr. Depp sued you and you chose not to pay it to the charities you pledged it to. Is that I, correct? Mr. I disagree with your characterization of that. All right, fellas. I think this is another good one and I'll see you next time. Have fun. See you. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.